I want to welcome all of you to this Global Genes webinar, Making Sense of Your Dollars. I'm Daniel Levine, Principal of Levine Media Group and host of Global Genes Rarecast. And it's my pleasure to be moderating today's panel featuring Lori and Pat Bergmer from 1847 Financial, which provides financial planning to individuals and families. Lori and Pat are experienced at dealing with advising families with children who have special needs. They're going to lend us their expect expertise today. I'd like to thank today's sponsors, Horizon Pharma, for its support of the learn. I'd also like to thank the F of Global Genes, and in particular, Ashley Yee, for her great work putting together and coordinating today's program. The webinar is meant to be interactive. I encourage people watching this live to use the instant messenger in the right-hand corner of their screens to send questions for the panel as we go. I'll do my best to work these questions into our conversation. We'll also try to save some time at the end for questions from the audience. When we're discussing financial planning. I do want to say up front that the focus of today's webinar will be on long-term planning for children with special needs. I understand that people dealing with a rare disease or a family member with a rare disease face great financial pressures as they struggle to afford care, balance their work and life, and bear their immediate financial burdens. While we're just some resources along the way, by and large, today's discussion is on long-term planning and the considerations parents will need to make about sharing a child with special needs with the resources to get the care he or she will need throughout her lifetime. Today, we're going to change our usual format a bit. Our panelists will begin with a presentation, and then the usual back and forth we do. I've asked both of them to present before the discussion begins. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Lori Leathers and Pat Bergmeier of 1847 Financial. Lori is an advisor with 1847 Financial. Before entering the financial services industry, Lori is a pharmaceutical sales representative, but when her son was diagnosed with Fragile X, that led to her making a career change as she sought to help other families navigate the planning process is a chartered special needs consultant with 1847 Financial and a certified financial planner. They're going to give us a look at the types of issues parents prepare for a child with special needs should consider, some of the instruments and resources they may want to avail themselves of, and some of the pitfalls to avoid. With that, Pat, sorry, please take it away. Thank you much, Danny. Uh, this is Liz, and I wanted to just start with a little bit of more background about my experience and how I entered into the special planning field. Uh, I am a mother of two children diagnosed with Fragile X. Uh, my six-year-old son is the one that's primarily impacted by Fragile X, and he does have an intellectual disability. His name is Dave, and he was diagnosed at about three years old in 2000 and Four. Uh, at that time, I was a pharmaceutical sales rep. I had been with, with pharmaceuticals for uh, 18 years, so my entire career. Um, and at that time, after my son's diagnosis, uh, I was able to stay with Merck for many years because I was in field sales. And that afforded me the flexibility I needed in order to, to meet the challenging needs of the term no appointments, people into the home for um, early attention, et cetera. That being said, I just wanted to throw that out there because it is important uh, to care that when a family has a child that's diagnosed with a rare genetic condition, uh, obviously there's a lot of different impact on the family, uh, including this one, which is the financial impact. And oftentimes that is one parent to um, stay home and help manage the child's needs. Uh, so, again, that's, uh, you'll see a lot of times that pe the professionals that are in the, the special needs uh, professional world often have personal experiences themselves, either through children or siblings that, that they have with special needs. the supportive partner or family member, that's going to um, allow one of the individuals to more support the needs of, of the child. Um, 
So I want some of the um, points that Danny had uh, presented to me uh, before going into the exact slide deck. And uh, being at what point should uh, consider the assistance of a financial advisor? And I'll just get that out there that as soon as possible, once you have a diagnosis and believe that it's a possibility, hard for us to know for sure always, but if you believe that there's a possibility that your child will need supports and services throughout their adult life, in addition to when they're in the school, then you want to start talking and considering financial planning for a child with special needs. So I'm going to go into the slide deck now to start in on some of the factors that need to be considered. Okay, things that we now are What's important to ourselves as caregivers of a special needs? And I think most of us would agree that maintaining not only the lifetime care, um, put care plan in place, but maintaining the quality of life for a loved one uh, is, is a priority. And you want to be able to have peace of mind when you're no longer around or no longer able to provide for your child's needs. Important part of this picture is protecting and maximizing any government benefits that are available, either federally and/or through the state. And also want to plan for the successful retirement of the caregiver. So, if there's a two-parent household and you have a child with special needs, often what you need to plan for is what we call a three-person retirement, because and if it's, it, it's likely that your child needs supports and services to um, support their adulthood. So you want to be able to ha uh, maximize government benefits, but then supplement what benefits don't cover by doing your own individual family financial planning. Other things that we'll mention along the way are how, how would you like to provide for any uh, neurotypical siblings that, that might be uh, in the household? And of course, always we want to minimize the impact of taxes or Uncle Sam. So, is that a majority of the time, these of children with special needs have not planned sufficiently. There's a number of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, it might just be logistical in terms of lack of coordination among your family's advisors, including uh, attorneys, tax and financial planners, uh, insurance leaders, government services, et cetera. So there's a lot of different what are often silos that we want to break down those silos and get everybody communicating together and on the same page. And that's one of the important things that a financial advisor can do uh, it's one that is, is familiar with special needs planning day in and day out. As an obstacle, you want to make sure, and Pat will address this uh, also toward the uh, webinar, but how do you identify an appropriate special planner? Obstacle is you just have, you might have a, a plan, you have a will, our Updated hasn't been dusted off for a few years, and of course things change year to year. So we want to make sure that we are able to keep up with those those in our legal documents. And I think what's the most common one is simply procrastination. And this is why I mentioned up front that the sooner you're aware of the potential your child will need support throughout their adulthood, that's when you need to start thinking about planning and start gathering information. Uh, because we all know that every day we're putting out fires when we're caregivers uh, with special needs. Uh, however, it's very important to step back and, and consider the bigger picture so that when they are about to enter into adulthood and leave the school system, uh, they're go going to have a uh, place that you're happy with that, that, that meets needs and your goals for your child. So we'll just kind of go through a pop quiz. I'm going to go through these slides briefly, um, and just to mention that there's there's three different areas of planning that we want to consider.
monitor and coordinate. And again, those are the legal through an appropriate spend needs a state planning attorney, government, government fits and care management, and financial, which is directly what someone like, like Pat and myself do. State planning documents that your attorney will prepare for you uh, are wills, your financial and medical powers of attorneys, and trusts, including a special needs trust. There are a lot of different types of trusts, so we're going to just give a kind of a high-level overview about some needs of trust during the presentation. But you want to definitely have a will in place because essentially if you don't create your own will, then the government will have one available for you and have um, for your, your loved ones once you're no longer around. And it's likely not to be a plan that suits your individual needs and goals. So very important for us all to have, have a will. And then types of trust. Again, we're going to talk about this throughout the presentation, but a special needs trust, and this, this slide kind of illustrates the fact that it's really creating like a, a, a protective bubble, if you will, around assets that you want to earmark for your loved one with special needs. So that's a great of trust is that they're creditor protected uh, and those funds in the trust are specifically earmarked for that individual um, with, with special needs. And again, different types of trusts and you, um, you also hear us talk about the role of the trustee as a, a person that your attorney and perhaps your financial advisor, we can always talk to you about how to identify an appropriate trustee, co-trustees, etc. So back to the quiz here. These are some of the basic questions if you ask yourself and that you've said yes to of these three questions, then you need to go back and, and consider your, your plan. So first of all, if you're planning to leave more than $2,000 of assets to your dependent with special needs, formulate a plan of care for your loved one, and is your dependent listed as a direct beneficiary of a life insurance or retirement plan? So things that right off the top we want to make sure are, are addressed. So according to federal law, and this has changed in a number of years, uh, if you leave over $2,000 in asked to a person with a disability, they're automatically going to lose their eligibility for government benefits and services. And that's a very low threshold, as I'm sure we can all agree. So benefits. What we're really wanting to consider is that, again, we want to make the plan is appropriate to allow our loved ones to, to remain eligible for benefits and resources after they leave the school system because it's, it's really more of an entitlement in the school years. So I know it's hard to think of it that way, especially if you're a parent of a, child, of a younger child with special needs, but really those are the easier days, quote unquote, um, in terms of benefits and services they're entitled to them until they become an adult themselves at the age of 18. So that's one of the important ages that you see there on the slide. Um, and there's also certain assets that are countable versus not countable toward that asset limit. And other important ages are, for example, ages um, 20 and 22. Before, the, before your child turns 22 years old, you want to make sure that if they have not already, that they're registered having a disability with your your state and county. The requirements do change a bit state to state, so I would encourage you to look that up. But um, I'll give you a couple of resources to refer to so that you can you can find out the requirements of, of your specific state. And up to 26 years old is usually how long an individual a child can remain on their parents' health care plan. After that, again, you need to kind of consider what are, what options are are there going to be to have in place. And I want to, and, and with that, I wanted to mention quickly before we transfer uh, the over to Pat. Uh, Medicaid.gov is a very good website to refer to because of these um, these government benefits do vary by state. Now, if you happen to live in Pennsylvania, you have an additional advantage because there's a what's called a Medicaid loop 
poll in the state of Pennsylvania. So that means if you have a child that qualifies as having a disability, which the state helps define, then that child is automatically going to be eligible for Medicaid. Again, that's in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and Annie mentioned we're talking now more along, along the lines of long-term financial planning, but of course it's always possible that uh, they are dealing with very high medical expenses when the child is very young. And how to best manage that really depends on the specific financial situation of the family. Uh, if it may be able to qualify for Medicaid if they are under a monthly threshold. And just for some examples here, I looked up um, for a household of one the eligible you can make up to $1,387 a month, the way up to a household of four, it's $829 per month. So just to give you a, a benchmark of some of the limits there um, to qualify for Medicaid. So it's often not going to be an option. And another reason to, to as least as possible, start doing some, some financial planning. But a, a qualified financial planner can also t look at your expenses, what are your assets, what kind of vehicles are, are they in in terms of retirement plans, savings plans, and they can help you come up with a plan to allocate some of those resources to, uh, to some of your medical bills. All right. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Pat Bergmeier, and he's going to go into more of the uh, specifics of final planning in turn and, and also along with some of the options you have when you have a loved one with special needs in terms of financial planning. Thank you, Louie, and uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning into the call. Um, as we mentioned, she gave a pretty good overview of those three areas of special needs planning. In the nine years that my practice has been focused on special needs financial and tax planning, I've tried to convey to families that it's it's more than just having legal documents in place or having some investments and, and fund resources. It's tying the two of those together with a plan and for loved one to continue caregiving, advocating for them for many years after you know the day comes that would I would imagine if you don't want to think about which is the day we are, we're going to pass away and at that point now what what's going what's going to happen to our loved one who's going to continue to there giving them the quality of life that you've always maintained and this this special needs trust and a quick disclaimer we're not attorneys so we can't give legal at least we can draft legal documents but this is probably the most important legal document that many of you will will have to create this special needs trust. Trust. The main purpose of this legal document is to protect eligibility for the government benefits Lori just talked about and to make sure lifetime care and quality of life are, are maintained for your loved one for the rest of his or her life. Uh, but in, in the purest sense, what a special needs trust is, is it's legally written down on paper. And paper does not guarantee that your child's going to be taken care of. So that's where the financial side, what, what we do and um, as financial planners, is to make sure that this trust is eventually funded adequately with the right type of assets in the most tax efficient way. So Uncle Sam doesn't come in on the back end to take potentially 40% of what you plan on leaving to provide for the future care of your loved one with special needs. So I don't know if any of you are aware of this yet or not, but Uncle Sam does not care from a tax perspective, if your child has a disability, he is going to tax them this way he would tax you or, you or I and sometimes even worse, depending on how what our funding strategy is for this special needs trust. Um, also found is the internet, while it's great to get information, it could also give us misinformation. And at the same time, other families, while there are tremendous resources to get information from so we don't have to go out and reinvent the wheel, uh, sometimes the information that we get from other families is not correct because I'm sure you found there's no manual for special needs planning. There's no step-by-step -step instructions to follow because everything has to be individual. It's just like an individualized education plan, your financial plan is individualized. Just because somebody has a child with the same diagnosis, same age, you may not qualify for the same benefits they might. 
So it's, it's understanding that and it's making sure that the advisors that you work with aren't trying to put you into some sort of cookie cutter model that they try to squeeze everybody into is that they make this plan unique to you and your family, focusing on your child with special needs, but not forgetting about the other individuals that are going to fill with very important roles for the rest of their lives. So um, the Googling special needs trust might hit you with different information, but there's a key difference in what you what you really need to find out about special needs trust. There is I mean, there are two different types of special needs trusts with a very important difference. These are third party and first party special needs trusts that, that you will create proactively, that you'll fund from your assets or from your other family members' assets. Any besides your loved one with a disability can fund this type of special needs trust. That, that's what the third party special needs trust is. It's known as a supplemental needs trust. So it can have unlimited amount of assets in it. It can be funded in unlimited amounts per year, and anyone can gift or bequeath, bequeath assets to it at their death to provide future lifetime care and quality of life for your loved one. Um, should your loved one pass away and money be left in this trust, it gets uh, on to whoever you want it to go to, other family members, your charities. There is no required reimbursement back to the state. The confusion that, that facts find when they Google special needs trusts is they, they start finding information about these first party special needs trusts or self-settled special needs trusts. These are actually funded by the assets of your loved one, uh, by him or her. If they commonly, they're created in the, as a result of a medical malpractice, personal injury settlement. So we have no choice in that, in, in that scenario. But the other way we refer to these, these types of special needs trusts are accidental special needs trusts. A first party trust, Party special needs trust is usually funded accidentally after somebody well intentioned leaves up loan a inheritance. That inheritance then makes them ineligible for government benefits, and our, our resulting option to continue benefit eligibility is to create a party special needs trust. The big difference between a first and third party trust is a first party trust requires a Medicaid reimbursement upon the death of the loved one with a disability. Just why nobody will have to create one of these, uh, with the exception of that malpractice or personal injury. So a third-party special needs trust is the one you're going to want to create. Um, you not only need to create it with the attorney, as you have. Then you next, the logical step is to come up with a funding strategy for it. How are you going to fund it? Is it today? You don't necessarily need to put anything into this trust until the primary caregivers are gone, which is hopefully for not for a very long time down the road. That's a stumbling block for a lot of families. They think they need hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars today to start putting into this trust, when in reality, the trust replaces mom and dad. It gives you financially when you're gone to get doing the things financially you were doing for your, for your child after the fact. So um, I want to emphasize uh, the importance of having a strategy to fund it someday be it our investments from our sale of properties, from life insurance, whatever the mix that makes the most sense and what you have available to work with, we do need a strategy that uh, we understand that we're minimizing taxes in that funding strategy and it's not the default, which is, well, whatever I don't spend in retirement will obviously go to my child's special needs trust. That is, that is not fair to you in retirement planning and it is, it is not a prudent tax planning strategy because it could open ourselves up to many gaps and pitfalls from a tax planning standpoint. Uh, at the um, skipping of these things to save save time, uh, I know the presentation is available, but identifying somebody that's then going to take care of the distribution of the assets of the special needs trust is the appointment of a trustee. And no pun intended, you do need to trust the individual if you're going to appoint a family member or friend. If you do not have somebody you trust or don't have anybody in general, then you can go out of appointing a corporate fiduciary. Uh, there's local banking ins institutions that have special needs trust departments. There's nonprofit organizations that can be a trustee. So it's been aware that there's other resources out there, and these can, these can also be there as a co-trustee for the family member that you have in place. But... Um, while important because they oversee the money that's in the special needs trust, what's as important is who's going to care for day-to-day -day your, your loved one. Identifying that care provider is a hard decision uh, to make and when you know there is no guarantee that that individual is going to you know, things the way that you want them to. And there is a document that is helpful from a more emotional stand in this planning, which is called a memorandum or letter of intent. And think of it this way. This is a day life of your loved one. 
what, what the routine might be and what your homes are for them, all the way down to living situations, working situations in the future. Uh, this is your document for your child. Um, it is, there is no deadline to finish it because it will evolve as they evolve. It is not a legal document, so it does not have a cost to create it. Um, it does, does not have any legal bearing, uh, though from a distribution standpoint for the special needs trust, but it really does help pave the pay for the trustee and other family members to know what you would have wanted for one if you were, you know, when you're gone. Uh, you know, we don't just want a pile of money sitting in the special needs trust growing and being there, we want it to be growing and dispersed to enrich the life of the, the love that you've left behind. So financial planning standpoint, uh, this is this is what I do every day, and we've been doing it every day for the past nine years, in the 12 years I've been doing financial planning, which is focusing on how financial planning is different when you have a loved one with special needs. Uh, we talked briefly about that three-person retirement. When you have mom and dad and child who may have an unknown support obligation that you're still going to need to provide for the rest of his or her life, then really planning a retirement for three people, your style and your child's. And it's potentially two generations of income, making sure when you as the primary caregiver retire, you can hopefully stay retired, live life that you want to and need to live, yet still provide enough when you pass away to continue providing for lifetime care for your, for your adults at that point have to approach things differently. Our decisions about how we invest, what we invest in, the type of accounts we put our money in, it's all a little bit different with special needs planning. Um, how we look at the insurances from our health insurance, our disability, our life and long-term care insurance, it's all different because we're planning for somebody's needs that may not go away when they're 22 years old and graduate out of college. It's a, in most cases what we found a permanent need that will never go away. Uh, so not only plan for the best case scenario, but protect against the worst. Uh, and that's something catastrophic happening to the primary caregiver. And, and one thing to note, if you have children that are young, if you have children that are, say, higher functioning and we don't know where they're going to be as an adult, having special needs planning provisions built into your plan is not a permanent sentence that they will be always disabled. It is a backup plan just in case the best case scenario does not come to fruition. So I mean, a lot of families proc procrastinate because their kids are younger or because they have an Asperger's diagnosis or something that may not uh, be as serious, as serious of a disability in adulthood that they wait and see. Well, because we don't know our last day is going to be that wait and see approach might have devastating results. Um, so getting down to the funding strategy, again, there is no one size fits all to that. Anything you see on this slide from real estate, investments, retirement accounts, life insurance can be used to fund special needs trust. From a tax planning standpoint, it really depends on the state that you live in. You've got to be aware of the different inheritance or state estate taxes that are imposed on these different asset classes. Because we have people from all over the country over the phone, from a federal standpoint, if you're married in a U.S. citizen, you are able to shelter roughly $11 million from this federal government in the form of a federal estate tax. Um, that's five and a half million dollars roughly each, and you get to combine your exemption. When I started in 2005, it was a million dollars of an exemption, and it was a use it or lose it. You could, cannot, you could not combine it without back then. This is subject to change. It could change every four years with depending who's in office, but the federal estate tax is the big one which most people think about. If you're in good news or bad news, worth over $11 million, it's roughly a 40% federal estate tax due on the amount above that. It counts everything on this list, property, investments, and life insurance. Um, state you live in may tax things a little bit differently. There are many states that don't have an inheritance tax when you go linearly to parents child or grandparents to grandchildren, which is a good thing. But there's one thing from a federal standpoint that none of us can escape, and it is the tax that is imposed on all of our pre-tax retirement accounts. The, we've been deferring income taxes on, that deferral ends when we die and we leave those to a non-spouse beneficiary. So your 401ks, your traditional IRAs, 403bs, thrift savings plans, 457s, whatever the pre-tax retirement accounts that you're contributing to, think of them as a ticking tax time bomb. And the lower they the taxes, the higher the tax burden is going to be when we pass it on to all of our children. Uh, the, it, the tax is called income in respect of the decedent. Many people don't even know what that is, but our investment advisors should be explaining it to us. 
So if we're going to be potentially passing on an account with an embedded income tax, tax of 15 to 40 percent to our children, is that really the best way to come up with a funding strategy for a special needs trust? Probably not. And our government dealing with a multi-trillion dollar deficit and they will their tax revenue. So the that might be available to our neurotypical is to even receive a pre-tax account might, might be limited. And they're going to be paying a, a, a rapidly tax bill to enjoy the assets that you leave behind. Our children special needs, this is because we are dealing with benefit eligibility. A pre-tax retirement account is liquidated usually in year one, not all the time, but typically in year one, they will claim it all as ordinary income pay the income tax on it as what is usually a single taxpayer, which is what your loved one will be, and you're looking at you know anywhere from 15 to 40% gone in year one. So again, there's each of you have different amounts of the, this, this stuff we call it. It's just understanding how to, how to look at these things differently when you, when you have a child in your life that has a disability. Um, skipping to things just for the sake of time so we have plenty of time for question and answers. Um, this slide we stop our presentation on um, with the abbreviated workshop today. Uh, it's probably information overload. It is a lot that goes into this. Uh, I will say it's not rocket science, but you do need to surround yourself by a right, the right team of advisors that are versed in special needs planning. Uh, we can stress the importance of working with an attorney that does special needs planning all of the time, not just a couple times a year, but is versed in the most recent changes and techniques to planning for special needs planning. So here, this attorney is not a dabbler in special needs planning. Any with a law degree can get can actually do this, which is scary. There's a lot of attorneys that even do estate planning that try to do special needs planning, but if they're not doing it enough, there's way too many mistakes that can be made. Have an attorney that has done some document drafting for you. You want to make sure that that is a relationship that you have, not a transaction. So when's the last time you heard from them? Are they updating you on the tax changes? Are they are they you know, reaching to you when your child's hitting ages like 18, 21, and 22, making sure you're getting things in place? And, and out of the estate planning, we don't find out until it's too late if it's not done correctly. And then we're not here any longer to fix it. So making sure plan is done right versus just simply having it done is very important. So dumping off legal documents minimally every five years is, is a very prudent idea um, because you know, it's an emotional task to undertake to, to do state planning. It also has an expense with it, which is why a lot of people don't want to do it again, but it does, does make sense to revisit it. Um, the legal planning is, is unique state by state. Uh, one thing we always, Lori and I provide pride ourselves in is connecting families to resources. So should one connect to attorneys that focus on this in your area, feel free to reach out to us and we can get you connected to some attorneys that um, you know, ex are experts in special needs of state, state law. From a financial planning standpoint, um, you hear from your financial or investment advisors more often than you would an attorney, but the question is, is does your advisor, your investment advisor, understand investment management, management within a special needs situation? The insurance advisor, do they understand how to look at life insurance and disability and long-term care insurance planning differently with special needs? If not, there might be gaps in your plan and it could be bringing in somebody that does is an expert in that area. Um, I will always recommend practitioners that you work with should be, should be a certified financial planner. Um, we as CFPs are always bound by a fiduciary standard. Um, there's a major law uh, executive order that was passed on Friday with the Department of Labor overseeing, changing the oversight of the financial services industry to impose a fiduciary standard. It is huge to make sure you're getting objective advice. And really, second opinion hurt. I mean, we have clients all across the country. Um, the conference call with a client in Seattle tomorrow. So the financial planning advice is not necessarily unique to the state or the county that you live in. Uh, it can be done a lot for with WebEx and things like this, uh, this, this day and age. So um, at, at this point, quick, um, as you know, our first meetings on the phone are really there to complimentary 30,000 foot overview of where you're at to see if it makes sense for us to have a further conversation, if there's any way that we feel we might be able to help. Connecting to attorneys and other resources in the community, uh, KH you on different strategies, tax planning for fund special needs trusts. And again, it's a comprehensive objective Found an approach that that we utilize. So, Sandy, I guess if you want to just get through, um, here's all our disclosures. None of that was tax nor legal advice. 
but I guess it's a good time to open it up to Q&A at this point. Pat Laurie, Pat and Laurie, thank you both. Uh, I remind our audience that they can instant message questions they have for our panelists, and we'll try to work them into the conversation as best we can. When your child was diagnosed, you made a decision to change careers in part because of your need to be more available to your child. I know that in the case of families with dual incomes, one parent may stop working, work part-time, or take on a job that gives them flexible hours from home. It's going to have significant financial consequences. Is, is there any advice you can offer people on how to weigh these issues and work through those choices? Uh, sure. Yeah. As I mentioned, what often happens is uh, a parent that does that was maybe working full time finds themselves either choosing thing that's more part time, as so that they're they're at least one of them is going to be able to have the flexibility to make sure that their, their child's needs are met. And that often includes going to a lot of different doctors, therapists' appointments. Um, I know in, in my case, you, sometimes you just need to be close to home because you don't know what's going to happen on a given day. I would often get a phone call from the school. You know, my child was, you know, acting out. His anxiety level was high. His behaviors were were uh, not best, so I'd have to pick them up from school early. So those are all the things. There's, there's, there's just so many things. A lot of them we can't plan for. So having that flexibility um, is key, and that's why I decided to eventually focus my efforts on helping other families that were in similar situations. Um, you know, just on a personal level, my my son now that he's 16, he just started this past year. Um, in a residential school program at a, at a, a location that's, that's close to home. Um, so I wouldn't have it any other way, personally. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that he's close to home. It's a great supportive environment, and he um, comes home every other weekend. So as time goes by and your child gets the services and supports they need, it's, it's, it may be possible to reenter the workforce in some capacity if that's the desire. Now, again, a lot of times that is being part of the special needs community somehow and supporting other families. Um, so, uh, hopefully that's helpful. But, yes, and that's part of the financial planning is that you may have to, for a while, plan on having a one-person income. And well, hmm? Is that the type of thing a financial planner can help you work through and, and you know, maybe more broadly, what are the realistic expectations someone should have and what range of issues should someone turn to a financial advisor to help them address? Right, yes. I, a financial advisor, again, we're, we're talking mostly about, you know, long-term planning. So the sooner a family starts, even a family without a child with special needs, financial planning is, is really essential because the idea is to have, Options open um, in the future uh, because we don't we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So yes, you can speak with a financial planner to help guide you through those more you know lean years, if you will, because there are definitely certain savings vehicles and types of retirement planning are more ideal than others when you when you have a child with special needs. And those are some of the things that, you know, Pat alluded to. How yeah, should people, someone go about, yeah? I was, was going to say, they would usually ask us one, when they need to start this plan, and we joke with them, look, it's one day before you die. So all things in place proactively um, before you pass away from an estate planning standpoint, then things will at least be maintained for your child from a benefit standpoint. So someone go about finding a financial advisor? Should they seek someone with specific certifications or licenses? Should they find someone who has specific experience working with issues faced by families with children with special needs? You want me to answer that one? I I would suggest, like I mentioned, a, a certified financial planner, practitioner, somebody that's gone through a very rigorous uh, training and education process on comprehensive fiduciary-bound financial planning. 
Um, the, they're a resource if you want to find financial planners in your area that do specialize on special needs planning with the, within the Academy of Special Needs Planners. Uh, any, any certified financial planner should be first go to. Again, and it, if they're not doing financial planning every day with special needs and understand not the financial but the human aspect of it, you might get the right advice. To add to that, that that's where the uh, it, that's where it's, it's helpful, and a lot of times you'll just find it naturally. If it is a, an individual, you know, whether it be an attorney, a financial planner, what have you, that is focused on families that have children with special needs, likely they were a parent or are a parent themselves or have a family member with special needs. And and speaking to someone that has directly knows or experienced that um, that type of challenge can be very helpful. It's not essential, of course, but, I, but it just seems that that's quite helpful because it's hard to understand our world if you're not living it yourself. One question from the audience had to do with competition for financial planners. Do financial planners charge a set fee, or is their fee based on how much is invested or managed? It really depends. It depends on the scope of how you want to engage the financial planner. The industry is really moving towards uh, from an investment management um, where it's fee-based in advisory accounts, where it's the advisors held to a fiduciary standard, where they charge a percentage of assets uh, at advisory fee each year. You're seeing a, the industry doing away with commission-based investing. Uh, insurance world, they're going to get compensated via commission for product implementation that you choose to do through them. And fi some financial advisors, some advisors like, like, like us like actually that, charge, charge a flat, flat fee to do financial planning. planning. You, you used a, a term earlier, um, the retirement plan in three. The, you know, multi-dimensional challenge as people who are trying to address this have to consider their own retirement planning as well. Are, are these best approached individually, or should they be thought of as part of the approach? Uh, have to be together. Um, most families. In, so we do, we ask them to raise their hand who thinks they're going to be provide a level of care for their child for the rest of their lives, and the, the, those hands go up. So if that care and the support continues to retirement, we need to build that as an expense into our retirement projections. And to have the right type of retirement accounts accessible to us and available to fund special needs trusts that are most tax efficient. So they, they can't be, they're not mutually exclusive of one another. They have to be looked at together. Talk about special needs trust. Each trust requires a trustee. How should parents go about select appropriate trustee? Uh, Lori, you want to tackle that one with how you did it? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, and that thing that really your uh, an estate planning attorney can assist with. I know when I met with my attorney, she kind of walked me through some questions and mentioned some considerations. Um, that she's there when you're choosing an appropriate trustee. And just so you know, in general, it's often um, more than an individual. You can have co-trustees because ideally you would have someone that's very close to the family uh, and understands the, the preferences of the individual with the needs, what, what, you know, what their, their schedule is, you know, what makes them happy, unhappy, and so usually it's a, it's a family member or close friend of the family is one, is one option. Uh, and then there are other more professional, if you will, options out there for um, care management. Corporations do provide a, a corporate type of trustee that just helps with managing the logistics of the special needs trust and moving assets in and out of the trust so once once that trust is active. In other words, once funds from that trust are needed to be used to supplement that individual's needs. So oftentimes it's a combination of individuals, but it's good to have some checks and balances because 
because a lot of burden to say, oh, well, you know, to make an assumption that a neurotypical sibling is going to take on that role. You know, my daughter is, um, she made it quite clear to me <laughs> that she does not plan to be my son's care provider, and I wouldn't necessarily, you know, want, want her to have to do that. So um, th that's why the earlier you start talking about and considering options, the better. Well, how should parents consider the sibling's role and, and needs when doing long-term planning? Of course, it's going to be uh, situation to situation uh, matter because there are, and I know, I know plenty of families that say, yes, they're, they're planning, their siblings are planning, either one or maybe multiple siblings are planning to have an active role. And maybe if there's more than one sibling, they can kind of define what their various roles will be in, in supporting, um, supporting their, their, their sibling. Uh, it's a care management organization, and that's another thing that, when you consult an appropriate special needs financial planner that you can expect help with, helping connect you with other community resources um, and organizations that can be there outside of the family to help with the caregiving needs, made the trust, et cetera. So again, you really, it's a good idea to have like a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with, with extended family to find out what, what people are wanting to be, you know, help to the extent that they are willing and can be involved. I heard it suggested that in planning for the long-term care of a child with special needs, parents should begin with a letter of intent. I know we've covered a lot of territory here. I don't think we talked about letters of intent. Would you agree with that? And, and what exactly is a letter of intent? Okay. Yeah, Pat did touch base on, on that, and a letter or memorandum of intent, as it is sometimes called, is, is an info. It's not a legal document. It's, it's a document, and, you know, we provide templates to families to start putting these together. But it's basically an outline of all the needs of the individual in terms of what are their likes and dislikes, Medications do they take? Who are their physicians? Um, what's their patient schedule? Food allergies. You know, are they? Do they have tactile defensiveness and only want to wear certain types of clothing? Um, colors that, that 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 they're drawn to. I mean, it's an endless list of possibilities, but it's basically all of the nuances about that individual that you would want another person that's involved with their life or in a caregiver role to know. So it's, it gives peace of mind to the parent knowing that should something happen, even for short-term purposes, they have to be out of town for a couple of days, um, they can give this information over to someone and that their child's needs will continue to be met. Should a parent seek the assistance of an attorney when creating this? Is this something that has any legal status? This is, this is not something that has any legal, um, you know, backing. It, so, again, that's something that a qualified financial planner should be able to provide to the family. So that's something else that families should look for and ask about is, you know, what do you know, if anything, about a memorandum or letter of intent? We'll talk about government benefits for, for a moment. How do government benefits fit in here? Should that be planning process? And what things will parents need to consider as part of long-term planning? Um, well, I can start with that. Yes, the government benefits, at, that can be a very important part of planning because you want, you want to make sure to take advantage of any of those benefits that might be available to you. Again, there's some, you know, federal-based, but um, others that are that are statewide. There's not a whole lot of types of resources out there. So, what are those that are available? You definitely want to be sure that you attain the eligibility for, and you know, take advantage of of having them there, so that the really the um, intent of the special needs trust is more to be there again to supplement any other benefits 
products and services that the individual is receiving. So it's really about maximizing both of those. Uh, a question from the audience about how easy it is to reinstate government benefits if it's lost for some reason. I, I don't know if either of you can speak to that. I imagine part of the issue is under what circumstances they're lost, but any thoughts on how easily they are reinstated if they're lost? Um, well, I can speak to that because I've had to do that myself. <laughs> and uh, the reason I lost them was just because I, again, I was before I got into this line of work and before I knew any better that I needed to reapply again in Pennsylvania so I can my can qualify for um, for med assistance every year uh, but I do have to apply for it so if you let that go by the wayside um, or if you're talking about Social Security um, you know SSI SSDI benefits once they're you know um, can, you can use, lose those resources if you don't keep up with the application process and providing the right type of information required. So it's really a matter of diligence and making sure that you keep really good records and document what the, um, the, the diagnosis, what disabilities are of the individual, um, so it makes it more difficult for them to be denied. And that's really a big part of it. And, and, and again, you know, if, if families need help for help in applying for for certain benefits, um, most qualified special needs planners can point them in a direction and help, you know, in ways that they can't help directly with. There are professionals out there. There's some. There's attorneys that that help with government benefits, and there's some other like parent advocates, things like that. That. So yes, it does depend on how and why they lost the benefits. It's not fun to uh, to reapply and and you know have that waiting game start over. So it's best to keep on top of the things as much as you possibly can. Uh, a group of parents, I think uh, it's fair to say, at least when it comes to medical care, are accustomed to working with teams of specialists. Is, is this something they should do as well when dealing with? Financial planning, we're, we're dealing with issues involving taxes and law and insurance. Do people need to be thinking about assembling a team of advisors? And if so, to what extent should their work be coordinated? Uh, no, I would. Yeah, the team, from a, at least the financial side of things, uh, you've got enough on your plate to give yourself another job of having to coordinate all of the different financial people in life. Uh, it would give you another thing to do, and that's what financial planners, that's what we always view ourselves as, is kind of the quarterback and coordinating the relationships between your tax advisors, your legal advisors, and, you know, your banking relationships, your, your realtors, your mortgage lenders, whoever it might be, to make sure everybody's working together cohesively on your financial planning. Um, I, I guess on the, on the medical side of things, a different story, Lori, if you want to answer it from that standpoint. Um, yeah, on the medical side of things, it can be you know, quite complex, and and it's definitely important to make sure that there's there's integration and and communication among all of the different providers that are involved in managing your child's needs. Because um, gosh, it can be from a, a primary care physician to various specialists, a psychiatrist. Um, behavioral therapy. So again, and from that regard, you just want to make sure that um, that the information is shared among them and that everybody's aware, for example, you know, different patients that the child might be taking, different therapies that are um, taking advantage of, et cetera, that are important in their day-to-day -day living. We have an audience question about the ABLE Act uh, is, is the ABLE Act truly new, or is it a different type of special needs trust? Um, I, I don't know if you could explain what the ABLE Act is and, and whether it is new and or a different type of special needs trust. Uh, I don't know if the slides are still populating. Uh, actually, the slide doesn't look like it's on here. Um, the ABLE Act is new. Um, 
just in our state in Pennsylvania, it was just approved on April 3rd. It depends on your state. Um, if you have active ones, but there are many states that you can fund an ABLE account from out of state. But it really, the devil's in the details about ABLE accounts. They are not a replacement for everything we talked about. An ABLE account is not a replacement for a special needs trust or, or, or financial planning. An ABLE account can simply be a potential complement to a, a properly drafted special needs trust because of limitations. A special needs trust can be funded with an unlimited amount of resources. An ABLE account can only be funded by $14,000. Uh, and a special needs trust can be used for anything that's going to benefit your child with special needs. And an ABLE account can only be used for what the government does as these, quote, disability-related expenses, end quote, which doesn't like fun and entertainment-related expenses. Um, so the, just, just aware of that. And you, you not replace a special needs trust and proper planning with an ABLE account. Other question from the audience, ask there are any list of financial planners and estate planning attorneys in Minnesota. I'd brought that to say, you know, depending on where anyone lives, is there a place they can find the list of planners and estate planning attorneys? Uh, yes, there's, there's two resources that we connect families to that are out of state from a legal standpoint. Uh, it's the Academy of Special Needs Planners and Special Needs Alliance, those two organizations you can search by. Um, the Special Needs Alliance, you can search by state, the academy, you can uh, and take a step. The Special Needs Alliance is attorney only, and it's in only, and the Academy of Special Needs Planners are both attorneys and financial planners that have to have specific uh, background to be part of that organization. So you can to those. We'll wrap today's session before we go. I wanted to ask each of you, what piece of advice would you offer to help people get started? Lauren? Yeah, well, you can start with with small steps. I think that one of the um, important things is to locate a qualified estate plan attorney. Again, focuses uh, on, on special needs trust. Um, and there's you know various ways to to locate them. If you go like, like on, you speak to fellow parents that have used different attorneys locally. That's often a good way. But if you go online to their website, you want to make sure that it says they specifically specialize in uh, working with families and creating special needs. So it has to be right up there and a focus of their practice. So again, you know, speaking with some of the that those professionals, I think, will help ease the anxieties about the process uh, and, and speaking to um, a, a qualified planner, perhaps uh, getting a fellow parent that has been through the process or using some of those resources that Pat mentioned to follow to ensure that you're talking to someone qualified. Um, I think doing things like this today, going and running a webinar, um, going to, uh, you know, a, an educational seminar, all of those things are very helpful because you want to gradually start to take in the amount of information that is out there. And Pat, you, any parting advice for how people can best get started? <laughs> yeah, well, special needs financial planning is not a do-it-yourself type thing. You can't go to Vanguard or to Fidelity or buy insurance online or, God forbid, go to LegalZoom to do this. You need to work with the right set of advisors. Um, paying for the advice, yes, unfortunately, all of us that I just named make a living off of doing this, but, but in quality of advice, this, this type of planning is way too important to, to mess up, and you'll be able to do it by doing it on your own. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their insights today, Lori Leathers and Pat Bergmeier of 1847 Financial. You can find more information on their website at 1847financial.com. I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, Horizon Pharma for its support of today's webinar and the staff of Global Genes and Ashley Yee for her work putting together and coordinating today's program. Be sure to join us for our next webinar, August 22nd, on building bridge between foundations and industry. I also want to remind our listeners that registration is now open for the Rare Patient Advocacy Summit, which is held on September 14th and 15th in Irvine, California. More information on that can be found on the Global Genes website at global.org. I hope you join me every week for our Rarecast podcast, which 
You can find on the Global Genes Rare Daily or on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. You continue the conversation with us by following on Twitter. You can find me at S. Levine and Global Genes at Global Genes. As you seek to learn more about rare disease and connect with others, I encourage you to explore the many resources available on the Global Genes website. On behalf of Global Genes, I'm Daniel Levine. Thank you all for joining us and being part of today's webinar.